Okay, so I have gone through my first example of pre-stack time migration via Kirchhoff summation, and that was my 1988 paper that um, took a deep crustal size and reflection line and migrated just the upper part of the data, uh, noticing the uh, in the first three seconds, even in, in common midpoint gathers, these negative move out arrivals. So with those negative move out arrivals appearing in three dimensions, there's no way that any um, that any stacking NMO correction process, dip move out process could work. So now now I do think the DMO would not work, but gotta admit I haven't tried it. So I recovered these uh, four sections, which are at uh, various places in the uh, in the three D model, um, and so I did not have to migrate into the uh, entire three D volume. I just migrated into one section at a time, and I think the uh, the data set was not that big. Maybe um, uh, since I cut it off at um, three or, or five seconds, I forget how much, um, out of the, uh, the 20 seconds that, that CoCorp lines were, were correlated to. Uh, since I cut it off, it was only um, five or six megabytes. And um, um, I had some pretty impressive resources at my disposal to attempt this uh, Kirchhoff um, sum migration when I was when I was in graduate school, it's uh, the first chapter of my thesis, really. Um, I had uh, uh, full use of a 100 megabyte disk. Uh, that was just beyond belief at that time. Um, and um, I ran it on a, uh, on a Unix machine that had, um, we thought it had uh, uh, four megabytes of, of RAM, but it actually had, uh, had two gig megabytes of RAM. Um, so uh, those were uh, very privileged uh, facilities to have as a grad student uh, back ages ago. And that was uh, enough to, um, to make uh, several attempts at uh, pre-stack migration. <coughs> um, and maybe it's just lucky for um, um, UNR and, and Penn State that um, um, that when I got my PhD in 1987, uh, there was another crash in the oil industry, and there were absolutely no jobs uh, to be had in uh, in Houston or Denver. Um, so uh, I had no no choice but to stay in academia. <coughs> Fortunately, that's not the case right now. All right. So this is a project that I did. Um, with my student uh, Sergio uh, Chavez Perez, um, who now is um, with the uh, the Mexican uh, Institute of Petroleum um, uh, (IMP) uh, in Mexico City, he also uh, teaches and advises uh, grad students at uh, UNAM, which is one of the largest universities in the world, um, with uh, I think over two hundred thousand students. Although uh, the Santo Domingo uh, the uh, University in Santo Domingo, they, they also had a uh, quarter million students or some awesome number like that, just beyond belief. Um, so uh, um, part of Sergio's thesis, uh, um, Sergio's thesis involved uh, uh, several different uh, pre-stack migrations, uh, and, and he still teaches this subject uh, to his students as well. Um, and he's brought it to uh, to the Mexican oil industry. Um, he has a, a section in his thesis on um, 2D migration with um, um, 2D migration with laterally varying velocity. So it's a depth migration, uh, pre-stack depth migration. That's from a, a seismic line across Death Valley. Uh, and he also has sections in his thesis on um, pre-stack time migration, just like I've been describing for Parkfield 
here. Um, but for another part of the San Andreas Fault, which is, which is here uh, in uh, Los Angeles, where the San Andreas Fault passes uh, about uh, 60 kilometers to the north, and um, there was a seismic experiment, um, an onshore, offshore uh, seismic experiment. Uh, probably Graham was involved, um, but I, I should talk with him about that, see what he knows. Um, they laid out uh, RefTech instruments uh, across uh, the LA Basin and uh, the San Gabriel Mountains, which is this mountain range here, and the Mojave Desert, which is this uh, flatter area to the north of the San Andreas Fault. And um, uh, then uh, off to the southwest, a, um, a large, um, uh, the Ewing, I think, uh, um, did uh, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, of air gun uh, array um, sources. And these were uh, recorded as uh, hundreds of thousands, uh, um, maybe uh, about two million traces uh, by uh, this Los Angeles re region seismic experiment, uh, line one. And that was an early experiment of the um, Southern California Earthquake Center uh, and in, in coordination with the USGS and, and my colleague, Gary Fuis. So uh, <clears throat> he... Um, uh, Gary published his uh, conclusions uh, uh, in uh, 96, and uh, they were along this section. And because uh, I didn't, uh, didn't go too far with my software, um, we tried uh, m uh, getting a crustal image by migrating along this north-south section that's here in pink. Um, now, what are, we, what are we doing on this, uh, on this section? Um, we're using an earthquake sequence um, that occurred uh, northeast of Pasadena, California, uh, called the Sierra Madre uh, event. And I have forgotten, oh yeah, uh, magnitude 5.8, so a pretty good shaker. Um, didn't do a lot of damage, um, but uh, sure uh, woke everybody up in uh, 1991. So that was uh, about the same time as the Lars uh, experiment was going on. Um, and um, so uh, I have, uh, uh, it was the same time as the Lars experiment was going on. Now, wait a minute. No, about the same time. I don't think Sierra Madre events were recorded by uh, the Lars deployment. Um, if they are, um, I haven't been privileged to see the data. Um, but there are uh, seismic stations, um, of course, in a fairly dense Southern California network uh, all around here. Um, and so I migrated uh, these, uh, these earthquakes as sources into this cross section, uh, which is sort of in between the Sierra Madre events and the Lars line uh, to try to um, get some, uh, um, get some, uh, uh, Additional imaging uh, under the San Gabriel Mountains. When you're doing an earthquake source like that, is that like a sideways continuation? How does that work? Well, the data in this case, the data are still still get recorded at the uh, at the surface, right? I'm just thinking your source. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so it does open up the possibility, right, that you'll have um, a source below your reflector, okay, which means then that you are um, you're then um, um, you're going to record a uh, uh, a diffraction from that reflector, but it's a it's a it's forward scattering. It's not backscattering, okay? And so uh, um, partly this is really exercising the, the logical limit of AVO studies. You know, we, we, can, we have now full circle coverage for, for uh, incident angle, you know, both above and, and below the reflector. And so I, I, didn't, I didn't really exercise this well until um, in... Um, uh, uh, right before the turn of the century, when when I uh, migrated the um, 
um, an earthquake data set from uh, New Zealand, the Eastern North Island, the Weber sequence, which had one earthquake sequence below the plate interface, the subduction interface, and one earthquake sequence above. And so that's uh, more of the story that I will I will show you after we've uh, seen some more, you know, the the ability to the 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 justification for why it makes any sense at all to use forward scattered waves, okay? Uh, that's all. Um, um, that's all in the in the theory that I need to develop for you about um, how the wave equation is connected to migration. And so once I've developed developed that through for you, um, then then I can show you the example. Okay. And um, uh, but you know that was that was going on here, okay? That was happening here, and and but I didn't explore the uh, you know the amplitude. I'm just after um, the location of structure here. I guess I was just wondering in the, the downward continuation step because you're not. I mean. You're well, well, okay. So thinking back to the exploding reflector model, right? Um, we uh, we use upgoing waves, right? And the way that I developed for you the um, imaging condition for um, uh, for um, the same kind of downward continuation, but for multi-offset, right? We we still use upgoing waves because we 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 use uh, um, we still use the 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 reflection point as kind of a a uh, an image source. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So but 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 notice how I'm doing the downward continuation now, okay? I am I am taking. Let's. Uh, this is a very good question. So uh, uh, I, I want to make sure I, I cover it. Um, I'm taking the. Uh, oh, this is a bit, there's a better diagram. Here we go. Okay. So wherever the uh, reflection point is, okay. I am I am taking the amplitude from this, uh, you know, the source wherever it is, the receiver wherever it is, <clears throat> and I'm projecting. Uh, I'm I'm, you know, I, I shouldn't count. I shouldn't call it downward continuation, right? Uh, I am projecting that amplitude onto that image point. Okay, just by lifting up and adding it in. Okay, and so that's. <clears throat> And, and you can see with this example, that's not that's not downward continuation so much as sideways continuation, right? But you know, put the source and, and receiver up on top of the thing, and and we're also downward continuing to that. So it's done, as you can see, it's done from from individual sources and individual receivers. So effectively, it's continued. It's it's let's call it ray continuation. Okay. It's it's a continuation under WKBJ ray theory, um, is is how it's actually done. You know, we carry the uh, the amplitude along a uh, array that's computed through a smoothed velocity model. You know, for which we can, for which WKBJ theory holds. That also means, and and also this early attempt with the Sierra Madre sequence doesn't have it. That also means that the um, you have to be several cycles away from the source and several cycles away from the receiver for the ray approximation to mean anything. If you're within a wavelength of the source or the receiver, then you know ray theory is is meaningless because ray theory is a high frequency theory. So, you know, as I put it, I mean, technically. For the theory to work well, you've got to be hundreds of wavelengths away from the source or receiver. But um, I say, if you're if you're within a few wavelengths, you are certainly vi violating that theory. And in that case, the you know the approximation to the wave equation isn't valid. Um, and so the but this uh, this migration from the um, um, from the Sierra Madre uh, aftershocks, this migration uh, is full of that stuff. You know, we we've got uh, we've got sources uh, and receivers that are 
you know, very long, very near the line. Um, you can see the wavelengths right in the section here, and um, you know, this is um, this like this. Uh, this is the the final migrated image at the upper left. Um, 40 kilometers deep, 50 kilometers uh, across the top, a north-south section through the San Gabriel Mountains. And um, you know, there's some kind of semi-coherent structure right here. Um, I, 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 this, um, this thing that appears here, I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of ellipsoidal, isn't it? Right? Looks a lot like uh, an ellipsoidal path, um, and uh, uh, but you know it comes to the surface right at the San Andreas Fault. Okay, and um, so I presented that at a uh, uh, seismological society meeting, and uh, I don't know. I think uh, either half the audience believed it too easily, and the other half of the audience, you know, said, "Oh." Louis crazy. What is he showing us? You know, so um, and I don't know if I believe it either. But uh, the coincidence is is pretty incredible. Um, so uh, um, you know, this this point here is right near an earthquake. Okay, and it you know for all the data that gets added in, it um, you know it's very persistent. But it's you know we're seeing here. Uh, this is back projection of forward scattered energy, and it's in the focal sphere of the earthquake. It's just a kilometer or two from the uh, the earthquake. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the theory, in terms of interpreting what the large amplitude of that of that scattering means and how to back project it into the section, I mean, the theory is completely broken down. Okay. We can't interpret it. Yet, we can get it into an image. And I think it's in the right place. OK? Here's a, here's a color version of, of this. OK? So near zero reflectivity is, uh, uh, let's see. And there's only 18 events here, including the, the main shock. Uh, oh, OK. Negative reflectivities are yellow. Positive reflectivities are, are dark. Okay, that's how this that's how this image goes. Um, so now let's let's overlay the black and white image the image section on Fuis's result, which I you know just roughly scanned out of out of his paper. And he showed um, uh, this top of a lower crustal reflective zone at uh, uh, seven uh, kilometers depth or so under the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, there's, uh, let's see, I think that's the San Andreas Fault there. Um, and, uh, and here's his, you know, in blue are his, are his most prominent uh, reflections. You know, not, not image with a lot of resolution, but, um, um, and he also had some blasts in the San Gabriel Mountains. So, uh, you know, this is a pretty conventional image of, um, uh, Fuis's image is, is it's great, uh, but it's also pretty conventional for, uh, uh, you know, this is all backscattering, it's all relatively narrow angle uh, of incidence, all of that. And he's showing this highly reflective zone. And you, you'll notice it's right on top of, of, of the highly reflective zone that I have. You know, maybe not exactly right there, but he's got another one over here. And, you know, so you could say it's pretty comparable. All right. So, um, uh, I think, you know, the, the Lars experiment, and, and I mean, Gary Fuis, he spent probably six years of his life just permitting the, uh, the explosions that he wanted to do in the city of Los Angeles and across the San Gabriel Mountains and then across the, uh, the Mojave Desert. And um, there's actually a couple of papers that he wrote. Um, you know, on the base on the base of just his permitting work and how he had to convince the local authorities that, you know, the large blasts he was doing in rather deep holes were not going to, you know, cause, uh, uh, you know, widespread destruction. Uh, in fact, the 
none of those blasts cause any destruction whatsoever. Um, but you could imagine, uh, you know, permitting seismometers and and blasts in in an urban area such, such as Southern California is a huge challenge. So, you know, uh, let's not let's not talk about the amount of money spent. Let's just talk about the amount of time it takes. Um, you know, what Sergio and I offered here was uh, a way of getting a similar image, and we spent. Um, we spent a couple of months, the two of us, working on this. Uh, you know, the data is all publicly available, no problem. And um, uh, you know, whereas we're talking, um, you know, six or more years of Gary Fuises and and many others' uh, entire lives. Now, one reason that I want to show this to you, um, and uh, you know, I presented it, but not uh, not published it. Um, is um, for this uh, this example I cooked up for uh, progressive migration. You know the problem with only with using widely scattered um, sources and well the sources are in a in a nice tight uh, cluster here, but they're not very well distributed. You know this is nothing like a, a this has a geometry nothing like a seismic reflection survey. Okay. We really we don't have any sources or any receivers at the top, you know, along the top of the section. Uh, and you know, I should have shown receivers on this map, but uh, you know, they're sort of scattered. There's there's um, uh, dozens of receivers, and they're all over this this area. And I chose you know it's pretty much a random section through that. Okay, so you know each uh, each earthquake record you know with dozens of traces that I added to the migration each earthquake record um, you know produces a lot of artifacts so here is the migration uh, at the upper left here of the very first record again dark is positive reflectivity and and light yellow and white is uh, negative reflectivity um, and and uh, what you're seeing in, in cross section here are the sort of cigar uh, shaped ellipsoids of, of revolution, okay, and so you're seeing them in in some sort of oblique section. Um, now now all the events are are right near here. Okay, now um, um, uh, then this next panel over is taking this one and adding the migration. Of the next event, and that event was deeper down and closer to the section, and so what we're looking at here is a section of this uh, sort of bent cigar shape, um, and and you can see that it's it's very high amplitude, okay, both on the top of the of the uh, of the ellipsoid section we're seeing here and on the bottom of the ellipsoid, and here's adding in the uh, the next one, and the next one. And the next one, and the next one. You can see it's it's not changing by much each time. Uh, and then we're getting some shallower events over here, and it's starting to uh, you know subtract from. It's starting to cancel out the what turns out to be false reflectors at the bottom of that you know second events uh, uh, ellipsoid of uh, of revolution. And it's they're enhancing the the top right. So here's another one. And another one, and the earthquake sequence keeps progressing. This one cancels that out the bottom a bit more, and then more events in a in a different place. Okay, and here's the final section, or maybe oh no, not quite. Um, there's uh, 18 events, so uh, you know we just keep going, and um, and then here's the uh, the final section. Um, and then I. Uh, uh, Cook this into a, an animation. Let's see. So uh, that's the the final section, um, fifty kilometers across the top and forty kilometers deep. And and again, you can see that the um, you know the pattern is set pretty early. Um, 
but uh, it does take many events to cancel out the false uh, bottom side of the, uh, or what what I believe turns out to be the false bottom side of the <coughs> um, uh, of the ellipsoid of revolution that we're seeing in this, you know, oblique section here. Um, now I really should have continued and uh, you know added in uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of events, although you know they were all in this area right up here. So hard to say, you know, how much better it would have gotten. Uh, you know, what what would be better would be to add in events from from all over the place. Um, so now let me uh, scroll a bit, and let's see. Yeah, see there, the San Andreas starts to come in, and then it kind of stays. It comes in very abruptly. Yeah, yeah. So there's, you know, I don't quite believe it because there's really only one event record that. You know, it's got dozens of stations in it, but it's it's only one event record that's really bringing that San Andreas amplitude in. I don't think it gets reinforced further; it kind of stays. You know, it is it is picking up things that that uh, uh, you know along here that that do exist prior, and it's reinforcing them over their their neighbors, right? Um, but uh, it's hard to make a case for this. Now, what's the other thing you're noticing here? I mean, 99% of what you're looking at here are artifacts. You know, they're uncanceled uh, uh, ellipsoids of revolution because we just don't have the coverage. Uh, what I should try now is uh, I should run this through the, the hail dip filter. And that'll get rid of the San Andreas, so I don't believe that anyway. And it will, it will enhance the, uh, the near horizontal um, uh, you know, top of, of lower crustal reflectivity that uh, coordinates with uh, Gary Fuises. So that's uh, that's something I I just ought to uh, ought to do. <clears throat> okay. So um, that's uh, you know that's a uh, getting something out of a. Uh, out of a data set that uh, uh, you know, lots of people, of course, look at uh, uh, earthquake recordings uh, from the Southern California network, and they have they have been for eighty years now. Um, but this was uh, this is something kind of new, and uh, Sergio and all and I also did the same thing for the nineteen ninety four Northridge earthquake sequence, and that we did uh, publish, I think, in Tectonophysics. Um, so that was in uh, in this area over here. <clears throat> um, so these are um, uh, these are migrations. They're time migrations. We don't have good information on lateral velocity variation. We have uh, you know kind of commonly accepted information on uh, velocity variation with depth, and that's actually the same as what Gary Fuis used uh, for his. Um, um, for his images, um, and uh, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, using earthquakes and LARS and, and many other things, there are some really excellent uh, laterally variable three D um, velocity models for uh, for the crust in uh, Southern California, and um, you know, so that that makes it conceivable. <coughs> well, in fact, uh, uh, there is. Um, um, there is a group at Wyoming um, uh, run by uh, Po Chen, and he presented at the last LARS meeting, as he's presented at every LARS meeting in the last uh, five or six years. Uh, he's presented results of um, 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 reverse time migration and, um, um, and um, full wave field inversion um, for, for Kind of uh, coarse, smooth velocity models throughout Southern California. And it's really uh, landmark work. Um, so, uh, you know, this uh, uh, this kind of thing, uh, you know, getting a little bit of reflectivity on one section is kind of a preview of what's possible and what has become possible in the last uh, uh, several years with, uh, you know, 
better computers than what I had available for my thesis. All right, I want to show you a, a very uh, um, a very compact little um, um, little study of a uh, synthetic. I call it the the truncation model. So um, uh, I took a uh, um, I mean you could make this meters or kilometers, but uh, uh, or, or uh, decameters if you wanted. Um, I took a, a, a little synthetic model, so it's uh, 50 meters uh, long by uh, 50 meters deep, and I filled it with uh, uh, smoothed. Um, you know, I generated random uh, uh, velocities. And I smooth them so the velocity values. Uh, this is a histogram of velocity values. Um, the um, the velocity values uh, uh, are a uh, are, are basically a Gaussian. And then I, I impose some so I have stochastic structure. And if you look at this uh, this B here, uh, especially if you stand back a little bit, you can your eye will follow a um, an apparent coherent structure along here. From there to there, okay. Uh, that's a totally random occurrence. I mean, it really is there, but it's a totally random occurrence, okay. Then I added some deterministic structure, and here you can see there's some little gray dots. Yeah, even in the projected image, you can see it. There's some dim gray dots uh, within the um, uh, within the deterministic structure. So the deterministic structure is showing a structural intersection, okay. Um, where uh, um, where this uh, low velocity zone that's flat is truncated by a low velocity zone that's dipping at um, uh, at forty five degrees, I think. Um, so the upper part of the dipping one above the the intersection is uh, C. The intersection is marked A, and then the lower part um, of the uh, dipping low velocity zone is uh, this part D. Okay. So I, I took um, 50, uh, no, uh, probably 100 acoustic records across here. These were made with full wave acoustic synthetics. So um, there aren't any <coughs> elastic waves in here. There aren't any Rayleigh waves. It's all, um, it's all P waves. And, 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 and then, of course, there are P wave multiples in there, too. I think you can see some of those uh, in here, but um, these shot gathers, uh, you can see lots of lots of diffractions, like um, uh, like uh, of the nature that that Clairbout's example showed before. You know, the shallow diffractions are up against the uh, our ref our reflective structures that are up against the uh, um, the uh, um, uh, the first arrival, so they're near the surface. And the ones that are deeper are uh, <clears throat> are uh, uh, are inside the cone of the first arrival, and you can see these. You know, there's some prominent reflectors, but uh, uh, you know they're kind of cut up by the random velocities, um, and uh, and and a little bit discontinuous. Uh, you could probably trace out here to here. You can trace out the. Uh, <clears throat> The reflector that's uh, uh, the dipping reflector. You can trace out the flat reflector here, uh, maybe the intersection, but it's all kind of bow tied together. There, you should probably plot it with an expanded time scale. Um, here now, here on the same, uh, you know, I make the the time scale match the depth scale, right? So uh, I made a one to one section, um, but I left it in time. So here's a uh, Here's a stack, you know. So I, I equal, I do an AGC basically of all the data, uh, the, all the traces. Uh, I know what the I stack at the average velocity, which is five kilometers per second. Okay, NMO correct stack. And uh, here's a, an image of the uh, of the flat part, you know, uh, and it's much stronger than the image of the uh, dipping part. There's also these uh, apparent reflectors that are coming out of that apparent but still random structure uh, that's above the, the reflector. 
the low velocity zone reflector. So you can still migrate this, and that that does kind of move over, move the uh, um, it does kind of move the intersection over to where it should be at A. Okay, and there's uh, there's C now, but you can see, uh, especially the 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 dipping reflector, it's it's not well resolved at all. Okay. Um, all right. So so this is as far as seven oh six could take this uh, this this nice clean data set. Um, what can we do now? All right. We can use uh, Kirchhoff, uh, you know, pre-stack time migration because uh, I'm I'm still you know I'm not I'm not programming in all of these uh, all you know the travel times through these exact velocity distributions. I'm 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 just using the average velocity, okay, that five kilometers per second. Um, so this is a, a not a depth migration, okay. Um, and what I wanted to see in this uh, in this uh, paper was um, can I can I get velocity information out of this? Okay. Um, so what you're looking at here are uh, it's a different kind of progressive migration. Um, you know, I take all hundred uh, shots, and there's uh, there's probably a hundred traces for a hundred shots. So there's ten there's ten thousand traces that go into this pre stack migration, um, and um, so uh, uh, this is done for a constant velocity uh, in the migration. You know, so basically selecting amplitudes from the traces, calculating the travel time, you're just using the Pythagorean theorem, and using a velocity that's too low, the wrong velocity. Okay, here's uh, in the middle here at five kilometers per second. These middle ones are using the, the correct velocity, five kilometers per second, okay, and then you know a velocity that's twenty percent too high, six kilometers per second, in this time migration, okay. What I what I want you to notice, and and I, I say this over and over again in, in my papers, and um, probably nobody believes me. I don't know why you should believe me, but um, in this example anyway. Um, you look at the the resolved geometry. Okay, we can't we can't really we're not really seeing the uh, the image of the of the dipping reflector where it's below the flat reflector below the intersection with the flat reflector. Okay, uh, but the intersection we're getting it. Okay, you can see it's misplaced. It's too high. It's too far to the left. You know, it's too far towards the center of the survey. It's too high, right? But we're imaging it. And we're getting the relative geometry correctly, okay? Not it's still hard to say, you know, from this image which one cut off, cuts the other, which one off, okay? But um, you know, this is flat, and that's dipping, and it's got the correct dip. You know, this is this is way better than the stack, right? So this this. Uh, now I haven't tested uh, dip move out here. Maybe dip move out would improve this somewhat. Okay. Um, all right. So so when we get the correct velocity, okay, you know we're we're you can see there's kind of you know under migration, and it, it's looking more and more over migrated with the higher the velocity. You know there's more and more of these uh, of these migration artifacts, which you you can see are you know they're called smiles. They're little pieces of those ellipsoids. Okay, those ellipsoids of revolution, and you can see them very strongly at the uh, at the edges of the uh, of the section. Uh, that's how you tell you know a migrated section from a um, from a, uh, a stack section. You look at the uh, you look at you look for the smiles. Okay, and when you over migrate, you get a lot more smiles. Okay, migrate at too high a velocity. Um, so up above is is you know the simple migration, just adding everything together, and down below is a uh, uh, a coherency enhanced migration. And when I lecture about Harlan's um, signal noise separation methods, um, I'll I'll tell you exactly how to do this. Okay, so uh, that's just another way of of looking at it. Okay. Now, now, one thing that 
that Harlan's method does is it looks for um, you know, enhancement of amplitudes. And um, you know, I looked at this at this series of, of migrations at different velocities. I wondered, is there a way that I could pick velocities? And this is before, you know, I had not I had not I, I, I never thought of the idea of common image gathers until um, until I heard about them from uh, uh, Al Yaya's papers, okay, and uh, and and his uh, groundbreaking papers on on migration velocity analysis. Um, so so you know I would have looked. Um, uh, I know now that I could have looked in the common image gathers for uh, for the velocities, but I was just looking at the final at the final stack, if you will, the final s completely summed migration. And there and there was something I noticed, okay, for this truncation model. All right, uh, let's just look at the uh, uh, at the the RMS uh, amplitude of the whole image. You know, and how that changes with uh, with the migration velocity. Okay, and uh, I did notice that there are these false um, um, high amplitudes that are around the sources and receivers. I mean, this is where the the migration approximation to the wave, wave equation is totally breaking down, and the amplitudes are completely invalid. Okay, so I looked at the whole the whole uh, the whole image amplitude. And then also I, I cut out the top ten meters, and um, and just looked at the bottom parts, you know, in the part of the image that I that I believed. Okay. So, um, but the the raw one, you know, the RMS amplitude of the whole image, when you when the velocity is too low, lower than the real one for the synthetic, the amplitude is low, and as you as you bring the migration velocity up, the amplitude increases. And uh, it reaches a, the raw amplitude of the whole section reaches a peak at uh, about ten percent too high a um, uh, a velocity, and um, uh, and then actually declines. So there's a peak that at least can suggest the the correct velocity. Okay. Now here remove you know maybe that that. Uh, uh, I'm I'm still unsure of the role role of that top ten meters and the incorrect amplitudes there, they seem to be providing the peak. Because if, if I look at B, the, uh, the uh, migration from um, uh, of the lower 40 meters, um, you know, I can't see the peak as easily. And it's a little harder to pick, you know, where the correct velocity might be. Okay. Here's, uh, uh, here's the focused uh, uh, reflectivity uh, from the uh, um, you know, this is just pulling out the things that migrate in correctly, and there are some things that migrate in correctly at too low a velocity and too high a velocity because there are lots of different velocities, you know, in this section, and there are going to be some things that migrate in, uh, you know, ten percent off the, uh, 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 even twenty percent off the uh, um, the average velocity. But here's kind of the same thing. You know, if we're way off in velocity, it's low amplitude, and then there is a peak that is uh, just above the correct velocity. Here, it's only um, it's only five percent above the uh, correct velocity, um, but there are other peaks as well. And uh, maybe in this case, the uh, uh, the the lower forty meters is a little more defini definitive. Okay. So here I'm trying to do a velocity analysis just on the basis of, of the, um, the amplitudes that are coming through the migration and the amount of focusing that we're getting. And I, I think it's, uh, it could work. But what I want you to notice mainly is that even if I get the velocity 20% wrong, you know, indubitably, 20% wrong, I still get this, the correct geometric relationship. I mislocate the structure, yes, but it has the correct um, relative geometry, and that's very well recovered and very reliably recovered. Here's another example uh, 
you can see it's exactly the same random background. Um, you know, smooth the same way, got the same uh, uh, histogram, uh, Gaussian histogram. I put in a, a cavity. Um, you can see there's still some random variations in there, but uh, uh, yeah, it's a very low velocity cavity. And um, uh, so here's uh, here's a, a, a Kirchhoff migration um, that is um, um, uh, that's showing uh, you know a version of the uh, of the random um, of the random uh, reflector uh, that's B, and then it's showing the top of the the cavity at least the side of the cavity that's uh, that's toward the center of the survey okay um, this is under migrated uh, let's see wait a minute yeah this one is uh, is under migrated and these are the Harlan enhanced uh, uh, focus reflectivities sections um, this one is under migrated this one is properly migrated okay I wonder you know maybe down here is the um, is the bottom of the cavity, okay? I mean, there's still going to be waves in the p waves in the air in the cavity, um, so uh, uh, you know. But there, it there, of course, the reflection from the bottom of the cavity is going to be much delayed by the slow velocity of the air there. So maybe it's appearing here, and then here is just out of the picture. Of course, you you know, time migration cannot really recover that uh, correctly. Uh, it would take uh, depth migration and putting in the velocity of the cavity. Um, so, you know, this this migration just notice that it's kind of working as a dip filter, right? We're only seeing the sort of gently dipping part of the cavity, uh, the top of the cavity. Um, now, why is that? Okay, um, that has uh, it's it's not the same reason that. Uh, uh, well, it's partly the same reason that we don't see steeply dipping structure in the uh, in the stack, okay? Because all of our sources of receivers are uh, are at the surface, and we're not the sources of receivers are not standing off far enough, say, to see you know to see this left wall of the cavity. We'd have to stand off out here, and we're not doing that. So it's really the limited coverage of the survey. That is producing this apparent dip filter, and here for the the cavity does not give nearly as strong a, um, uh, a velocity resolution. Um, it uh, uh, let's see. So here's the truncation model, um, and, and this is looking at maximum amplitude instead of RMS. I think maybe RMS is better. Um, but uh, the maximum amplitude in the section uh, climbs and then reaches a plateau, you know, just uh, two percent uh, at a, at two percent higher velocity than the correct velocity. The uh, expected signal, the coherent migration, um, you know, it's not really showing any resolution. You can tell when you're way off in velocity when it's way too low, but not when it's too high. Uh, and then uh, the raw KMIG at uh, maybe that's the expected signal at 10 to 40 meters depth. You know, there's a suggestive bump at the correct velocity, but it's it's pretty minor. Uh, the cavity model, okay, uh, pretty definitive when you're uh, under all these different uh, examinations, even under maximum amplitude when you're at too low a velocity. But um, you know, it it. It's also the maximum amplitude doesn't show any fall off at, at velocities that are too high. Um, I suppose there should be fall off uh, later on. You know, when you're if you have twice the correct velocity, right? It should it should definitely fall off. Okay, so I think I think that's enough for uh, for today. Um, exercises in, and demonstrations of uh, pre-stack time migration via Kirchhoff. Uh, summation. And uh, tomorrow we'll go into pre stack depth migration and my early examples of that. <laughs>